Well, hello again. My name is Adrian Gilbert, and today I want to continue our little series uh, called A Revolution in Evolution. This is actually part three, the last part. So if you haven't watched parts one and two, you might be advised to do that. But this, this part will also be uh, self-standing. So, and I'm going to take you through um, a, a brief resume of what went before. But of course, I, I've been um, highly critical of Darwin in this series and of his theory of evolution, that everything has just evolved willy-nilly out of uh, matter, that uh, you, you just somehow came across uh, the, the first cell, the, that somehow molecules came together to form a living cell, and somehow that cell divided and, and modified over long periods of time, maybe, and through a process of spontaneous change and survival of the fittest, we've ended up with the world we see today. That is basically, um, I put it very crudely, but that is basically what Darwinism teaches us. And I don't think that holds water. I think it's actually a mistaken view. But if I'm going to be critical of Darwin, then obviously I've got to put something in its place. There's no use just tearing down things just because you don't like them if you haven't got an alternative theory to put in their place. And that's what we're going to be doing today. I don't claim it to be a fully fledged uh, theory. This is something to be worked with, but it is a new direction that I think we should be looking at now. So without more ado, uh, here's the third lecture, uh, A Revolution and Evolution, Part 3. Now, Charles Darwin, as you know, was this uh, Victorian gentleman who lived between 1809 and 1882. In Part 1 of the series, we looked at Darwin's theory of evolution. And we discussed how he came up with, this, with his theory that all of life, in its man, many forms and variations, has developed from a common ancestor, a spontaneously generated single cell life form. According to Darwin, the diversity of life that we see today is not the result of a creator god, but produced by spontaneous adaptations modified by survival of the fittest. And to illustrate this, uh, he devised a tree of life diagram. This is actually a copy of his, his own drawing that he made, a little sketch, to illustrate what he was thinking. Um, the tree of life diagram, whose branches symbolized the diversity of all life forms, past and present, from the original single cell organism. And you can see this proposed single cell organism standing at the bottom, given a number one. We then examined more recent work on the DNA code. This, it is now clear, is very similar to computer code, except that instead of using binaries, ones and, two, ones and zeros, it makes use of a chemical code. This is structured on four nucleotide bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And you can see they're given these, these letters, A, G, C, and T. And these, these, uh, uh, the, these uh, nucleotide bases are shown within the structure of the DNA. You know you have the double helix. Well, on the inside of each helix, you have these projections and the nucleotides are attached to the projections and they you actually have two copies you have one going down that way and another going up that way exactly the same and the two uh, twisted strands of the dna don't actually touch so these nucleotides on these endpoints are freestanding and they're what determine how that part of the uh the code is used, what it's going to do, what kind of proteins it's going to make, which is what's so critical. 
And it can be argued that it's simply impossible through a, a process of chance and things just happening for the code, which is very exact, like a computer code. Now, I used to be a computer programmer, and I know that you cannot just take a computer program and arbitrarily change things and expect it to work. And most of the time, it's end, going to end up causing a bug and the thing won't work. You have to be very exact in the way you specify the orders, the menu, as it were, within the code that you're writing. And it's the same, exactly the same with animal uh, and plant codes within the DNA. And actually, if those codes get messed up, you end up with things like cancers. Or if, the, if it's within a fetus or something, you, you end up with an abortion. So a spontaneous abortion, I should say. So the process, the suggestion that this just happens arbitrarily, these days is challenged. And we went into that in some detail in, in the first lecture. So statistical probability shows that his system could not have arisen by chance alone. It takes intelligence to create intelligent systems. So we have an intelligent system within the DNA coding system. It, it shows to create that level of intelligence requires intelligence. It doesn't just happen. It's like the old story about the monkeys writing Shakespeare or typing them out. How many millions of years would it take a monkey to type out even one uh, play by Shakespeare just by chance, um, let alone the whole works. It wouldn't happen, would it? But a typist, you know, a skilled typist who's got intelligence can very easily take a copy of Shakespeare and type it all out. Your monkey, even if he could see what's written on the pages, he's not going to be able to do that. <laughs> he's just not going to be able to register that he's got to copy what's on that page onto his computer or typewriter. So we have this idea that it takes intelligence to create intelligent systems. Now, I then, in lecture two, um, went into this, the whole thing about uh, railways and using, uh, contrasting the Darwinian idea of the evolution of life forms with something that we're all familiar with in engineering terms, the evolution of railway locomotion. And we went through all that starting off in 1802, I think it was, with the first ever steam engine, which pulled a few coal trucks in the Penydaran Ironworks in Merthyr Tydfil in Wales, right up to the present. And we showed that this evolution of these steam engines didn't just happen. It was a, a, a process of engineering where clever people were modifying things. But that even that wasn't enough. We showed that the... Uh, there were several different um, creation processes happening which could not evolve from a single entity. There was the introduction of diesel locomotives, diesel electric in America, and the introduction of electric, all electric locomotives which draw their power from a third rail or an overhead gantry. Those are not, could not just evolve from the basic steam engine. You could argue that Stevenson's rocket, which was one of the very early steam engines, had developed into the Mallard. The very, the far, it's actually a, a British locomotive which holds the world speed record for steam, 126 miles per hour. You could argue there's a, a line of evolution within that process of the steam engines. But you, you cannot make the same argument about electric engines or diesel electric engines other technologies have come in there there's something different happening and that's kind of like with life forms who had which life form had the first eye how, how do they come about the idea of having a liver or a kidney uh, how do these things happen these are major major changes to suggest that that just comes out arbitrarily from uh, some single-celled organism over a period of time is nonsense you know the whole the, the whole thing about the human body and any actually any animal body come to that 
is that it is a whole complex of different systems which work together to make the whole work. So if your kidneys aren't working, the rest of you is not going to work properly. If your liver's not working, the rest not. Heart, all of these, these systems, and they're very delicately balanced and work together, and they're controlled by this whole DNA system, which required intelligence to put it together. So the, the Darwin theory might have been okay back in the 1880s, 1860s or 70s or whatever, but today it's very deficient and it's lazy, laziness of, of scientists that they're not looking to replace this theory with something that's more credible. So I've written down here. In part two, we looked at the evolution of railway locomotion and compared this with Darwin's theory. We discovered that whilst this could be represented by a similar tree diagram to Darwin's, this was misleading. In actuality, it is clear that electric and diesel locomotion does not evolve directly from steam. These were fresh inventions and not adaptations of something already existent. And that's exactly the same when you go properly into the whole Darwin theory. So in this video, I want to present an entirely different hypothesis from Darwin's. Instead of assuming that the evolution of species happens by chance and is controlled by survival of the fittest, we will look at the question from the other end. Is there any evidence that life, meaning the diversity of life forms, was planted on Earth from elsewhere? How might this have worked in practice? So instead of saying that life has just evolved out of the dirt, out of, out of maybe in the water or in the dirt of the earth, the earth itself, what about if the earth was here and then it was terraformed, that life was brought here? How might that have actually worked in practice? I mean, we're planning to do that, or well, some of us are anyway, Elon Musk is, to transfer life from this planet to the planet Mars. And before that, they, they want to take life from this planet to the moon. They want to have moon bases, uh, flourishing colonies on the moon and then flourishing colonies. Actually, Elon Musk wants to have a city of a million people on Mars. <laughs> it sounds outrageous, in incredible, but maybe it's going to happen. And his, his, his reasoning is actually quite logical that at the moment we're a one planet species. If anything happens to this planet, some comet comes crashing in or there's a super volcano goes off and blocks off all the light for a decade and all life dies, human life dies with it, uh, we have to start all over again. But if we had colonies elsewhere, for example on Mars, if something horrible happened to the Earth, after a suitable period of time people could come back and reintroduce life. A sort of Noah's Ark, you could call it. Anyway, so that's kind of... Uh, uh, where we've got to be looking, I think, is to think, has this Earth actually been given life from elsewhere rather than life evolved? And if so, how could this have worked in practice? So, if life did not arise on Earth by chance, where might it have come from? The answer could be from elsewhere in our galaxy. But where exactly? I've considered this question for many years and also done much research into ancient cultures. And I should, I should say here that one of the reasons I'm very... Uh, involved in studying ancient cultures and I've written books as you probably know if you know who I am that is <laughs> uh, about pyramids in Egypt about Mayan prophecies going into these cultures uh, um, my book Magi was very much connected with Turkey and actually I went to the city of Edessa or as it's called now San Liurfa in Turkey in search of certain answers to questions and I didn't know it at the time but they were just starting to make the first investigations at Gobekli Tepe, a hill near to Urfa, which uh, is where they've now found 
extraordinary structures. You've probably seen pictures of them, and I'm not going to go into this, but structures which they believe go back to at least 8,500 BC. And if they dig lower down into deeper layers, they might find something even older. So our whole concept of civilization, when I talk about civilization, what they found there was carved pillars with animals carved very carefully out on them. Uh, recognizable animals, uh, a sort of almost a Noah's Ark of animals <laughs> that we can look at today. That did not just happen, and that was not just barbarians um, just having a go. And yet, and yet, this uh, complex existed before the Neolithic era, before actually the introduction of uh, husbandry of animals and agriculture, the, the de deliberate planting of uh, certain plants to make uh, to, to harvest, especially grains. Uh, we're, we're back in hunter-gatherer time, supposedly, and yet here we are finding extraordinary architecture that doesn't belong to that age, that would be credible in, in Roman times or Greek or whatever, but it doesn't seem to belong to eight and a half thousand years ago. So there are question marks that we have to have. And one of the reasons that I've studied ancient cultures so much is that I think they knew things that we have since forgotten. And yes, we're brilliant at certain things. You know, our electronics, for example, I couldn't be doing this if it weren't for modern civilization. Uh, I don't think the ancient Egyptians had mic uh, microcomputers and laptops and, and video cameras and so on. But did they have something else? Did they have knowledge which we have since forgotten? And therefore, I've been studying those cultures, trying to find out what they knew that we have forgotten. Anyway, let's press on. Once you dig beneath the surface and recognize that religious myths and legends are mainly metaphors, it becomes obvious. Ancient cultures, insofar as we understand them, seem unanimous in having believed that life as we know it comes from the constellation of Orion. And there you can see the constellation of Orion. It's a very bright constellation. Uh, mostly here in Europe, uh, we think of it as a winter constellation. Actually, it's, it starts rising um, at sunset around the time of, of the... Uh, winter solstice so that's around christmas time we start seeing it rising at sunset and it's at different places at different times of of night um at different times of the year and i'm not going to go into all of that but that's to do with the rotation of the earth and the movement of the sun around the zodiac or we see it as the sun moving around the zodiac actually it's the earth moving around its orbit around the sun obviously and so orion is going to at some time in, in the summertime, we can't see it at all because it's quite close to where the sun is. When I say close, the sun is obviously in front uh, as we're looking and we can't see because of the light. But at different times of year, we see it rising at different times of the day or night. Um, anyway, that's by the by. So this is not really surprising. Our solar system lies within a small spur of the Milky Way called the Orion Arm. Now, again, I'm going to do other lectures on this, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But our galaxy, the Milky Way, we're looking at it edge on, and we're about two thirds of the way out from the middle. So what we see is a splash of stars, a great band of stars. Actually, we see it divided in two parts, the part that you you see at one time of the year at night time and the other part you see at the other at night time at the other six months later more or less so we, we have a wrong view of what our galaxy is we know it's a spiral galaxy and if we were standing above it and looking down it would look somewhat like the andromeda galaxy probably and it has two major arms which go around it one's called the gemini arm and the other is called the Sagittarius arm. 
And again, I'm not going to go into that. And there are other subsidiary arms. And there is what's called the Orion Spur that sticks out from the Gemini arm and maybe connects also with the Sagittarius arm. It could be a, a kind of, rather than a cul-de-sac, it could be a connecting link. I think the jury is out on that one at the moment. And virtually all the stars that we see, the bright stars at night time, when you go out and you look up at the sky and you see all these stars, that are, they're the ones that are close to us. That's why they're bright. Get a telescope and you'll see far more. You'll see a whole sky full of stars. You'll see other galaxies in enormous distances away. But just with your naked eye, when you go out at night, you, you see a scattering of stars around the sky. These stars are the ones which are close to us and they are also within the Orion Spur. So as far as the ancient Egyptians, the Maya, and I believe also the ancient Britons were concerned, the Orion constellation, and more specifically the region where the great Orion Nebula in the sword uh, was heaven. And that's where the Orion, sorry, I can't see this. Um, the Orion Nebula is in the sword of Orion, which hangs down from his belt. You can see the belt stars, the three bright stars, Al Nitak, Al Nilam, and Mintaka. And then you have the sword hanging down there. And there is actually a bright nebula there. Uh, this nebula is actually the nearest nebula to us. And people with good eyesight, which leaves me out, unfortunately, can actually see that nebula with the naked eye. You can certainly see it with a telescope. It's been known for a very long time. So this is where the ancient peoples tell us, and I'm going to show you the evidence for this, is where mankind comes from and where heaven is. Now, Osiris and his wife, Isis, were the two most popular gods in the Egyptian pantheon. It was believed that they had incarnated on earth along with a brother called Set and a sister called Nephthys. Osiris ruled over Egypt, introducing law, piety and religion. He's, he's regarded as a good guy, a good king, the first king uh, who introduced law and order. At the time, according to the Hermetic writings, the earth was in chaos and there was a lot of bloodshed happening and and lawlessness so the earth prayed to God to send his seed to the earth and God sent Osiris and he kind of introduced into Egypt um, ideas of religion and piety um, but he was murdered and dismembered by his jealous brother Set however Isis his wife and sister brought him back to life I mean, she, she gathered up parts of his body. So this is what the Egyptian mythology is all about, a lot of it. Um, Set, the evil brother who killed Osiris, chopped the body up and scattered it along the Nile. Um, Isis patiently went around gathering up the parts of the body of her dead husband, bound them together with bandages to make the first mummy, then learnt the magic words of from the sun god, Ra, or Re, to resurrect Osiris. She had to trick, trick the sun god into telling her. <laughs> There's all sorts of stories about this. But anyway, Osiris supposedly resurrected. And don't ask me how, um, but he was able somehow to have sex with her and impregnate her. Uh, a bit odd because, according to other legends, his phallus had been swallowed by a fish in the Nile. <laughs> So he didn't have a phallus even. But are we talking here about um, some kind of um, artificial insemination? I don't know. I mean, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility, is it? But anyway, the, the legend goes that Osiris was resurrected. She got pregnant and then he departed. He went off to the stars and he went to Orion. Um, they're very clear on that, which is why the pyramids were built to, to represent the stars of Orion's belt. And if you haven't read it already, 
I do recommend you get the Orion Mystery, which Robert Boval and I wrote together. It's actually, he was the one that came up with this theory, and I don't want to uh, pretend, I certainly don't pretend that this was my invention, but he made this extraordinary discovery, and I don't know if you can see it clearly there, but you can compare the three pyramids of Giza on one side with the three stars of Orion's belt. And the match is extraordinary. It fits perfectly. So we know that the ancient Egyptians were rarely into Orion, but even more than I've shown you here. So he was murdered and dismembered by his jealous brother, but Isis brought him back to life. She gave birth to his son Horus, while he ascended to the constellation of Orion. There he ruled over the souls of the worthy dead. All right? So this is Egyptian mythology. Uh, you could say, well, that's paganism. We don't need to listen to that. But I'm saying maybe we should be listening a little bit because maybe they knew things that we have forgotten. So in Egyptian mythology, Osiris is the father of... God of the dead and he sits on his throne in heaven now you can see him he's in his heavenly court there he's sitting on his throne behind him are Isis and Nephthys Nephthys is the one that's closest to us and you can see that by the, the things they have on their head which actually give, give their identification those are their hieroglyphs and Isis is the one a little bit further away so there he is sitting on his throne and this th throne was thought of as being in the lower part of Orion. And I'll come to that and the evidence for that in a minute. The ancient Egyptians performed rituals aimed at transforming the pharaoh into an Osiris. They wanted to become one with their god. So what we have in the Egyptian religion, there's the oldest literature in the world that we have the original text of is the pyramid texts actually inscribed on the walls inside some of the pyramids of the uh, well the last pyramid of the fifth dynasty and some of the pyramids of the sixth dynasty and what is recorded there is not a sort of straightforward narration of the story of Osiris it's collections of prayers of spells of wishes and statements um, which, when you analyse them and go through them, they do kind of tell you what these people were believing. And they, the pharaoh is given an Osiris name after he's been through certain rituals. Um, while he's alive, while he's the pharaoh sitting on the throne, he's regarded as the incarnation of Horus, the son of Osiris. After he died... He was believed to have been gone through these rituals and resurrected, departed this earth, and he's now got an Osiris name and he's gone to join Osiris in the heavenly uh, place in Orion. However, um, the Egyptians expected to be judged after death, so only the virtuous joined Osiris in heaven. Those who failed the test went to the North Polar region to be consumed by a crocodile-headed monster. And this is the test, so the weighing of the heart in the balances. And in this picture you can see on the far left-hand side um, Anubis, uh, the sort of uh, jackal-headed god. I think he's, I'm not sure if he's a son of Osiris or brother, I'm not, I can't remember exactly. But anyway, he's leading in the soul here, the, the soul of the dead person dressed in white. And then he's going to weigh in the balances here uh, a little jar which represents the heart of the person against a feather. The feather represents macht, which is truth. So he's going to be, be weighed in the balances against truth. So has this person been true? Is his heart true? Is he a virtuous person? If he is, then you see this other uh, ibis-headed figure on the right of the balances. That's, that's Thoth, or Taut. 
and he writes the name of the person in the book of life and then he's led on and you can see his horus headed god a hawk headed god there leading the soul onwards to the court of osiris so that's what he wants but on the other hand you can see standing next to the balances like a, a dog waiting for, for its uh, dinner is this crocodile headed monster and if the person has failed the test if they if they're evil then they're going to be gobbled up by that monster who's lurking at the north pole or near the north pole now i want to take you now to a sepulchral ceiling that's a sep sepulcher because they haven't found a body there and they don't think this guy Semut was actually buried there but he, he obviously had his built for him and he lived at the time of Queen Hatshepsut he was her vizier and the ceiling of a mausoleum from the 18th dynasty right so she's she's 18th dynasty tells us much about the Osiris religion the connection with Orion is spelled out clearly and you can see those three stars there above this little figure in, in his little boat there uh, he's, he represents Orion in his little boat and next to him is the star Sirius which is close to Orion by the way and that star is connected with, with Isis and, and the hieroglyphs above it tell us that so Sirius is a close neighbour of ours in fact it is the closest bright star um, it is the brightest star in fact it's the brightest star in the sky although much closer to us it is in the same region of the sky as the much more distant Orion now if you look at the hieroglyphs that are above the ceiling here and I've done other lectures where I've gone into all of these in detail but I'm just going to summarize a few basic elements here you can see the middle part represents Orion that's how the Egyptians represented it and they seem to know that there are dust clouds in Orion that's what those dots are there and the hieroglyphs for Osiris um, you can see the hieroglyphs for Osiris there he's sitting on on his that you can see an eye above a throne and a little figure of a god sitting beneath it that is the hieroglyphs for Osiris and the hieroglyphs above uh, represent the lower part of Orion I got it there yes the lower part of Orion so it's telling us that in, he's in the lower part of Orion is where Osiris is and also the sons of Horus that's what those that star with three little fountains coming out of it and a hawk beneath it and a couple of stars that means the sons of Horus and which means the solar system actually are stars in Orion so the sons of Horus it's us, the human race. I don't know if you realise that. We are the sons of Horus. So, in the Egyptian context, as above, so below. The, on one level, you have Orion representing um, the, the constellation there. They call it Sahu. And it's kind of uh, its heavenly region. And descending from that is our solar system, which is in, as I said, the Orion Spur. And on a lower level, you have Osiris and Isis who came to Earth and they had a son called Horus. So you have the big Horus, who is the kind of sky god of the solar system in the Egyptian religion. It's the, 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 the solar system is Horus. Um, and his eye is the sun, or one eye, and the other eye is the moon. This is one conception that the Egyptians had. The other conception being that there's this uh, Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, who is the first pharaoh. He overthrows his wicked uncle Set and re-establishes law and order in Egypt. And all other pharaohs who come afterwards, when they're alive, they regard themselves as the incarnations of Horus. They're doing a Horus job, basically. And when they die, they want to become Osiris. They want to do an Osiris job and go to Orion. And I've, I've done other lectures on this, so I'm not going to go into it in any more depth than that. Oh, you can see Osiris there. 
So the father god of the dead, Osiris, sits on his throne in Egyptian heaven, which is in Orion. And standing on a lotus flower are the sons of Horus. Those are the sons of Horus, represented by these four little figurines. And they used to bury those, or images of those, with the person in their mummy. And one meaning of Horus is son of Osiris, but the macrocosmic Horus was the solar system. And the sons of Horus are ascended humans drawn from the four directions. Because the four figures represent the four directions, north, south, east and west. So now I want to leave the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian religion for a moment and, and turn our attention across the Atlantic to the Maya lands. Now, you might think, well, you know, that, that's a much more recent civilization than the Egyptian. And in a sense it is. But... I believe, and there's good evidence, that the roots of this civilization are just as old as the Egyptian, if not older, actually. Um, they go back, perhaps, to Atlantis. Now, I know that's not a word that we like to use very much in polite archaeological circles. But there is uh, evidence to suggest that the what we know as the Maya and the Aztecs Toltecs, the Olmecs, all of these people who date roughly from the thousand BC onwards, uh, they were not the originators of much of what their religion was about. That they hark back in their calendar to earlier times, uh, particularly around 3114 BC, which they claim is the start of the present age. And that actually, coincidentally, ties in with the start of Old Kingdom Egypt. So, yeah, there are connections here. Not as obvious as one might like, but there are connections. And you'll see that there are also connections to do with the mythology of these people, although it's expressed in a rather different way from the Egyptians. So that's where the Maya lands are. They're in this sort of southeastern part of Mexico and you've got the Yucatan Peninsula and then you have the area beneath it which includes Guatemala and parts of Honduras and El Salvador, Belize uh, and Mexico uh, well that's the, the, uh, the lowlands um, of, the, of, the, of Mexico and the traditional Maya um, hut would have a fireplace in it, and that's where they do their cooking, right? They've got to make their, their chapatis or whatever they're eating on something, and they, they would have these three big stones, the hearth stones, which they could rest this uh, plate on, and they could put their uh, tortillas, I think that's the right term, on the plate to cook them, or they can have a pot there to cook that. And these three hearthstones were seen as being representative of three stones that you see here on this codex um, picture on the back of a turtle. And this turtle seems to represent Orion. And the ecliptic there is represented by these symbols above. And so you have these strings hanging down from the ecliptic uh, with sun symbols uh, beneath it. Um, dangling down and Orion is actually below the ecliptic so this kind of fits with that picture and actually the three stones represented three stars and it's not the belt stars or it's only one of them Alnitak the lowest one and then it's the two stars Saif and Rigel or Rigel um, which represent the knees I think of Orion in most representations but what really interested them most was the sword area in the middle, which they saw as being a fire. And just as you inside your hearth, your hearthstones, you had a fire. So, you and here we can see actually a, a photograph. I think it's taken with the Hubble telescope, this one. And you can see the three stones, stones one, two, and three. Um, I'm sorry, this, we seem to have got some kind of menu thing popped up here 
But anyway, I think you can see it clearly enough. And you've got the place of creation in the middle. And they saw the, um, the nebula as being like the smoke coming off the fire. And you can see how this whole Orion constellation, when it's viewed properly through a big telescope and the tuned in on the right frequencies, you can see all these dust clouds and uh, electric plasma clouds and so on all through it. It's a very, very active place in the sky in its own right. And here we can see a close up of the place of creation, the great Orion Nebula. And you can see all these streamers and this is a very electrically active place. Uh, as you maybe know, I'm very much into the electric cosmology, what's called the electric universe, uh, which sees that a lot of what we can't explain about astronomy and about uh, certain things that telescopes are showing us that can't be explained by gravity and big bangs and explosions and c collisions can be explained very easily once you understand that um, the universe is highly active electrically. Highly active. It's actually the driving force in the universe. Now, in the Mayan mythology, the story goes that the first man, Hun Hunapu, and his twin brother, Fukab Hunapu, came to Earth from the place of origin. And they were challenged to a series of games by local underworld gods. The twins lost and were put to death, and the head of Hun Hunapu was hung in a calabash tree. A calabash tree is a kind of, calabash tree is a kind of gourd tree. Um, so his head's hung up there like a gourd, dangling there. But the head spoke to a passing maid, the daughter of one of the underworld gods. And Hun Hunapu, his head, spat in her hand and she became pregnant. So again, a bit like the Isis and Osiris story, the dead um, Hun Hunapu is able to impregnate someone. Um, he doesn't have a body at this point, he's just got a head. But what he does is he spits in her hand and she becomes pregnant. And she gives birth to a second pair of hero twins. And if you want to know more about the story, then, you know, read a book about the Maya. You find it all in there. And these twins were smarter than their father and uncle had been. And they tricked the underworld gods, who are demons, and defeated them. Right? So the, 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 the second pair of hero twins, um, they're real heroes, and uh, they defeat the dark gods who are kind of devils you could call them fallen angels maybe something of that sort if we're going to talk in christian terms demons and in due course they resurrected their father out of the ball court the ball court and the turtle represents planet earth right so planets tend to be represented i think as turtles and you can see why because Think of plate tectonics and all the plates and the way they're joined together to make a tortoise shell. And then there's a crack in the tortoise shell. Is that a crack between the plates? And they resurrect first father and he returns to Orion. He's, he's the corn god uh, who is much venerated by the Maya. They believe that we are descended from the corn god, which is why they like to dress up as the corn god. Right, now, so now I want to leave Egypt and Mexico and have a look, little look at England, at Britain. Uh, because it might surprise you that we also have this same connection with Orion uh, that, that these other cultures had. And going right back to the ancient Stone Age and coming right up forwards to probably just a little bit before the Roman times. And we find an echo of this actually in <coughs> the Welsh stories known as the Mabinogion, or the Mabinogi. Um, there we're told about how the realm of the dead, which they call Anuin, uh, was ruled over by a king. And his name is Arion, which 
is both on the one hand it's uh, it's Orion Arion Orion it's also the equivalent of the uh, ancient Jewish Aaron you know the, the brother of Moses is called Aaron and I haven't really investigated the connection between Orion and Aaron but there are connections that I've <clears throat> gone to in some of my books linking Orion with Elijah or Liar <coughs> anyway so in the Welsh tradition that's come down in the Mabinogi the king of the dead who would be the equivalent I suppose of Osiris in the Egyptian connection and there are links between Britain and ancient Egypt for example um, certain measures uh, you know that have come down to us what we call the British imperial system is based on the, the Egyptian system and, and certain measures are in cubits royal cubits and actually I, <laughs> this made me laugh when they were doing some DNA analysis uh, on uh, villages in, in Britain in, in England I think in particular where the people hadn't moved around they were still pretty much the same population that they've always been they found that there was a very strong connection DNA wise between the ancient British and the family of the Pharaoh Akhenaten because <laughs> they've done a lot of work on uh, the, the Amarna Pharaohs where they've got their bodies um, uh, Tutankhamun of course and they can trace their DNA and they can say oh well there's a similarity of DNA between these ancient these British people living today and these ancient Egyptians so there is this this link between Britain and Egypt which is really not been discussed too much in archaeology but I think probably ought to be but there's even more than that and I'm going to show you now um, when we go back into the Stone Age or even earlier we find monuments like this this is the in North Yorkshire um, it's called Thornborough Henges now I should I should tell you that a henge monument you had a stone henge the henge bit refers to an earth circle and there's a lot of these in Britain where you have a sacred circle and you can tell the difference between a defensive circle and a sacred circle that with a defensive circle they would dig a ditch and they would pitch the earth inside so you have a, a you're coming to towards the circle you've got to go down the ditch and then you've got to climb up the bank on the other side you know it makes it that much higher doesn't it with a sacred circle the ditch is on the inside um, so you have the bank and then you have the ditch and then you have the the, the sacred ground in the middle the idea of the circle being a protected zone of some, to make it sacred. Well, at Thornborough they have three of these, 150 yards across each one. Um, a huge monument. And you can see that it appears that two are in a straight line and one is offset. And that's very similar to the way that the Egyptian pyramids were laid out, with two in a line two in a line and then one slightly offset and it's typical of the kind of Orion belt um, situation and they found at these monuments that there was indeed an alignment so I'm going to read this out called Thornborough Henges it consists of three connected circular earthworks each henge or circle has a diameter of some 150 meters and when built they were colored white by means of calcium sulfate paste and this was no doubt to make them look like the great henges of Wiltshire, like Stonehenge, of course, um, that being cut into chalk are naturally white. The effect was to make them look from the air like earth stars. So you can imagine that if you were looking down at these, uh, one day I must go up there with a drone and see if we can fly it over the top and take some pictures from exactly over the top. Um, but for the gods who are floating in the air, you see, if you're an ancient person and you're thinking about this, they could look down and say, oh, yes, all right, yeah, okay, this is the sacred place, it looks like Orion. Uh, it's, that, that, that seems to be kind of part of the th thinking in Egypt, but there's also this idea of as above, so below. 
that if you create a model on the ground of something up there which is important to you, there is a kind of link. So you can do your rituals down here and it's going to have an effect up there. That seems to be part of what this is all about. So we have got this Orion monument and they did actually, there was actually a TV program I saw on this where they had found that the, the alignment was towards the setting point of Orion. So, you know, it does seem that these people in North Yorkshire and probably throughout Britain were into some kind of Orion religion, cult, whatever you want to call it, that was to do almost certainly, I would think, with the dead and with resurrection and ascension. So here you can see uh, in this uh, pyramid overview, you can see how the, sorry, I can't see it yet. Uh, you can see the how you have the three pyramids. The two big ones are in alignment along their diagonal axis. And then the little one, uh, which represents the less bright star, Mintaka, is slightly offset. And this is a, you know shows us this deliberate thing. And Robert and I talked about this in, in the uh, Orion mystery a great deal. And the Thornbury, Thornborough Henges built around the same time as the first pyramids were going up in Egypt. So you have to wonder, is there a connection? Um, and I've got another little picture here that you can see it. I've tried to sort of um, manipulate the pictures so they look a little more similar here. Archaeologists who have investigated these monuments have discovered evidence that Thornborough Henges, as well as resembling the stars of the Belt of Orion, were aligned towards the setting point of it. This could all be dismissed as coincidence, were it not that there is other cultural evidence to indicate that, as in Egypt and Central America, the constellation of Orion was identified as heaven, or at least the realm of the dead. And I've said that, you know, I was talking about Arion as the king of the dead. He also, actually, he has hunting dogs. And of course, Orion is followed by his dogs, Carnis Major and Carnis Minor. So there's another connection there. But here's an even more astonishing uh, connection, which seems to go back to the Iron Age, which is just before the Roman period. And you can still see it today because they refurbish this monument regularly. And uh, you know, this is the Cernabus giant. I mean, he's a bit rude. Sorry about that. Uh, but he is quite clearly meant to be an Orion figure. So if we look at the mythology, we soon discover that Orion features heavily in prehistoric mythology. We see Orion in all his glory as the chalk giant of Cernabus. Because he's shown with an erect phallus, it's assumed that he is some kind of fertility symbol. However, the phallus represents the sword of Orion. The testicles then represent not fertility, but ancestry. Uh, his phallus symbolizes the source of the human seed. I want to make that clear. I mean, we're not necessarily talking about, oh, there's a, you know, if I go and sit on that phallus, I'm going to get pregnant, which is kind of how it's presented in archaeological textbooks. I don't think that's about it at all. What it's really talking about is that this is the source of the seed, the semen that made the human race. And the phallus uh, in this representation is the equivalent of the sword in other representations of Orion. In other words, that's why they were interested in this figure, uh, who by then is, is Orion the hunter. Um, but they recognize that there is this connection between the human race and the source of the seed, the DNA, that has created us. Sorry if that sounds uh, um, terribly heretical. I mean, I'm a Christian myself. <laughs> At least I like to believe that I am, and I absolutely do believe in Jesus Christ. But we do have to look at what people thought before that time, and whether there were these, I don't like to call them race memories, but these memories from the past that were incorporated into 
the uh, symbols and the mythology of those pre-Christian eras. Uh, so from a Christian standpoint, this sounds heretical. Are we saying that Orion is God? Not at all, but it does seem to be closely linked with the human race. Now I've put another picture in here to show you the uh, how the figure does represent Orion. You can see on the left-hand side there Orion uh, as, a, as a star stick figure. And you can see how the Sir Nabis Giant has got a club. The stick figure has a club. He's holding up his club in his right hand. And, and in his left hand, he's holding a staff. Well, we can't see the staff on the Sir Nabis Giant, but you can see how he's holding his hand out. And that presumably did hold a staff at one time, but that hasn't been preserved. So Orion holds what's usually interpreted as a staff in his left hand. This is made up of a number of fairly faint stars. The CERN giant holds out his hand in a way that suggests that he too was originally holding a staff. This has been lost over the centuries. It is not known when this hill figure was constructed, but it was probably during the Iron Age, shortly before the Roman invasion of Britain. So there we have it, the, uh, the British connection with Orion. And I think that it's pretty conclusive. So we've got Egypt, we've got Mexico and Central America, and we've got Britain. I'm sure that if you went elsewhere in the world, you would find the same thing being expressed in ancient mythologies, perhaps through old ancient earthworks or stoneworks or whatever. Um, this seems to be something that the human race did know about at one time, but have forgotten. As I said, that's why it's important to study these ancient cultures and religions. Now, I want to take you now back to the Bible for a moment and the story in Genesis. Now, I know many people reject this totally as just so much nonsense that so we've moved on from that with our science. But I want you to take a little look and think about this in terms of what we've looked at with the Egyptian and the Mayan material. So in the Bible, it talks about the Elohim or spirits of God um, who live, uh, you know, who create man. It's actually a plural word, Elohim. And we have to ask ourselves, do they live in the Orion Nebula? I don't know. But it's, I'm just posing this as a suggestion at this point. If that is the case, it would seem stupid for them to repeat the whole process of writing DNA code for new species on every single planet that they want to terraform. Now, I don't want to get in hot water with uh, devout Christians. I'm one myself in my own way. Um, or devout Jews who look at the Bible as the, as the word of God and everything in it is exactly right. I'm not disputing that one bit. But when you actually read the Genesis account and the way that creation is done in stages, it starts off that there's already something there that you could call the earth, but it's without form and the waters are not being separated from it. The waters above and the waters below. There's nothing living on it. It sounds very much like... Um, a process of terraforming something that was dead and bringing it to life and introducing life forms on it, which are done in stages in the book of Genesis in the different days, culminating with the introduction of man. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that this was all done in a week. These days are to be taken figuratively. Do they mean a thousand years? Do they mean a million years? Do they mean a billion years? I don't know and I don't care. They're stages, and the stages have to be gone through. But put yourself in the shoes of a high intelligence. And for argument's sake, let's say that high intelligence is dwelling in Orion, and, uh, probably dwelling el everywhere in the universe. But let's say that that is our local station. Yeah, it could be like our local branch bank of a big chain of banks, or your local... Uh, branch of Sainsbury's or Tesco supermarkets 
uh, where you go to do your shopping. They've got supermarkets everywhere, and, but this is just your local one. That's kind of how I think of it. Now, if these guys have the job of terraforming planets, suitable planets, which are in, let's say, the Goldilocks zone, for argument's sake, are they going to start every time reinventing the steam engine and slowly developing it? I don't think so. I think they would have a seed bank of some sort of different species, different uh, types of plants and animals that are suited to different environments. You might not have an oxygen-rich environment on your planet. It might be full of nitrogen, carbon dioxide and something else. You would need something that could deal with that, work with that. It might have a hydrogen, you know, environment and you'd need to be able to deal with that. It might be a totally watery planet. You need, you need to be able to deal with that. But I think that they would just like, uh, you know, good programmers, they keep their code. You don't throw, you know, I've been a programmer. You don't throw away old code. No, 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 no because you might be called upon to do another project very similar to the one you've just done and you can take your old code and you can adapt it much quicker than starting from scratch writing you know page number one <laughs> yeah and doing your data names and everything from scratch much easier to take code and adapt it and make it fit for what you want to do and we actually see this with life we notice that all of the higher forms of life, um, <clears throat> I'm talking about animals here, are based on a system of, of two arms and two legs, or four legs, four limbs in other words, and a head. Um, that seems to be universal. Now go back to worms and you could have done it differently, but somewhere down the path this system with four limbs was developed. And it's been used and adapted and adapted and adapted in all sorts of ways. Everything from the giraffe um, to a monkey to a dog to a cat to a mouse. Everything. They're, they're all basically similar. And even uh, you can say the lizards. They've all got four, four limbs uh, and a head. The dinosaurs, even Tyrannosaurus rex with his little tiny arms, um, was based on that model. Um, so... We can see that there are code that's being reused over and over again. Now, the Darwinists would say, well, yeah, of course. So it's just because it's been, you know, it's a random change and it hasn't changed that bit. So it's just adapted. I don't think that's the case. I think it's because when you have code that's been worked out and it works, you don't throw it away. But it takes intelligence to adapt it. And I think that somewhere, I mean, we have seed banks on this planet. I think in, in Iceland they've got seed banks of every plant that they've, they've collected seed from and kept at sort of, you know, certain temperatures so that it will survive. It's actually a rather dangerous place to put it, I would have thought, because Iceland's a place that's quite volcanically active. But who knows? Maybe they've got another one at the North Pole and the South Pole. I don't know. But the idea of keeping a seed bank... And that's exactly what Elon Musk wants to do with Mars. Basically have a seed bank that life could be reintroduced to the Earth um, should something horrible happen down here. And I think God's not stupid. God is going to want seed banks and if he's going to introduce life, he's going to reintroduce it from the seed bank. He's not going to start from scratch. That's what I think. Anyway, maybe I'm wrong. But I offer it to you in that way. So, it would seem stupid for them to repeat the whole process of writing DNA code for new species on every single planet that they want to terraform. It would make more sense for them to amass a database or maybe even a seed bank of the DNA for different life forms that could survive on planets at different stages of their development. From the Orion Nebula, or wherever the seed bank is based, life could be sent out to any promising planet. There we have a series of promising planets. <laughs> there is a likelihood, therefore, that were we to visit these planets, 
we would meet life forms not that dissimilar to those on Earth, at least some of them, I would have thought. We'll find bipedal people like ourselves. Um, maybe, you know, just as we have different races and, um, and different races look different, I'm sure there'll be much more marked differences on different planets, rather like you get in some of these uh, uh, Star Trek movies and, uh, and the like where they go to somewhere else and the people got funny looking heads and, and whatever. And they might well be like that. Or there might be a different species altogether developed down a different line of evolution. But the concept would be the same. The idea of uh, a physical being that has a brain or a, a group of brains. We've actually got more than one brain um, who are able to think and be intelligent. I think we would find that elsewhere than just here on Earth. We may even come across animals such as dinosaurs that are extinct on Earth but living elsewhere. So, uh, I, I put that to you because in the Bible it's implied, actually it's not even just implied, it's said, that... Uh, while man was sown on earth, you know, the, the, the story of the, the, the man, you know, the sower who sows the good seed and then the, the enemy comes along and sows weed seeds with the good seed and the farmer has to take a decision. Do I go, go around and pull out the weeds now? And he says, no, I'll leave and let them both grow together. And then come the time of the harvest, that's when I will sort out the good seed from the cockles, as he calls them. And it's kind of implied in that, that alongside this um, uh, terraforming of planet Earth, somebody else came along and sowed other seed here. Let's call him Lucifer, shall we? Does this mean that maybe the snakes and dinosaurs weren't meant to be here. Maybe they've come from a different line of evolution and it wasn't meant to be introduced here. Uh, I'll just leave that with you as a thought at this point. But um, we do have this idea that uh, things have been sown on this planet and we don't really know their origins. So that's. I just want you to think about that. And while we're at it, Look again at this fossil record with these breaks in the uh, different ages where there were things were almost wiped out. At one point, 95% of all life was wiped out. Uh, but there's not a full explanation by any means. For one thing, we don't know how such life forms are transmitted to other planets. Yet, at root, the DNA code for species is simply data. This could, in essence, be transmitted electromagnetically. And this would work just so long as there is some kind of receiver and computer to take these signals and use them to build life forms. So is this the truth about the Gaia hypothesis? that the planet itself is alive and able to act as a receiver of genetic information. Alternatively, we could be talking about aliens bringing the seeds of life and planting them on Earth. Could it be that successive extinctions and new beginnings were deliberately done by them in order to hasten the time when the Earth could support humans? Well, this is all very speculative, and I, as I say, I am only trying to introduce these ideas as a, the beginnings of a new hypothesis. But when we start thinking in, term, in cosmic terms about life being brought to planet Earth, then it opens up all sorts of different possibilities as to why we have so many radically different species on this planet. Um, Yes, we're, you know, we're f most familiar with the ones in our environment, you know, the dogs and the cats and the horses and the trees and the flowers and so on. But you go down in the ocean 
deep down and you find all sorts of very, very different creatures, starting with things like octopuses, which, uh, you know, they've got eight limbs instead of just four. They have only one eye, I believe. Um, but they have very large brains and they seem to be quite intelligent. Um, and there are all sorts of other peculiar creatures in the sea. Where have those come from? Are they indigenous to planet Earth? Have they been introduced here at some time or other? Does it matter? Uh, it opens up all sorts of possibilities. And it also opens up the possibility that there can be other planets that we could go to. Uh, I'm not talking aliens here. I'm not a great one, actually, for alien migration in spaceships and so on. You know, the, uh, the standard model, you could call it, of alien intervention, the little green men come out of their flying saucer and, uh, you know, they start doing nasty things to us and that sort of thing. I tend to think more spiritually in terms of soul travel that people, you know, we're only inhabiting these bodies temporarily anyway. We are spirits in a, in a material world, in our, our material bodies. These spirits of ours, could they inhabit different kinds of bodies, different planets? different star systems altogether, different galaxies even. I don't know, but it's, a, you know, a possibility. And it opens up a whole different view of the universe. And so on that note, I'm going to leave it with you, as I think this might be the seeds of a new kind of image to replace Darwinism. It needs a lot more work done on it. A lot more intelligent people than me probably to, to do that work. But I think this is the direction that we should now be thinking. So thank you very much uh, for watching this video and for watching the series, if you have done. And I look forward to being with you again. I think I'm probably going to go back to doing the next ones on the Book of Revelation. So if you haven't been following those yet, there's a whole series that I've done. I think we're up to about Chapter 8 or 9 at the moment. Um, we've got another... 11 chapters or something to do it was 12 um, maybe it's 13 to get through that book which is I believe what we're living through at the moment so thank you again and I look forward to our next meeting bye